Hello and good afternoon to everyone. I am Alexia Few, Supervisor for the Women's Missionary Society of the 5th Episcopal District of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Today's event matters. California is a state that we cannot afford to lose. In addition to its size and largest number of electoral votes, California often sets nationwide trends and maintains outside influence. With that in mind, it gives great pleasure to Bishop Few and me to welcome and thank the first partner of California, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, for speaking to us today about the importance of voting. Thank you also to everyone in attendance. I am pleased to turn this event to my appointee, Lena Louise Kennedy, who now heads the AME Church's 5th Episcopal District Women's Missionary Society Political Action Commission. At this time, I would like to introduce the executive team of Women in Leadership Vital Voices. These are the women that make these programmings that we offer to the community happen. Janet Braun, Ellen Dago, Dr. Yolanda Gorman, Sheila Greta Miriam, Linda Griffey, Tina Hostovich, Jihi Ha, Beverly Morgan Sandals, Doris Robinson, and Carolyn Rose William. Thank you, women. In addition, we have community partners that we work with throughout the year. We have Jocelyn Griffin, who is here with us tonight. She is the chairperson of the Women in NAACP. Jackie DuPont Walker, who is the AME Church Social Action Officer, not just for the United States, but for the world. We also have Dorothy, Dr. Dorothy Bales Weber, who is the chair of the AME Be Alert. She is not here tonight. She had an emergency, so we'll keep her in our prayers. And we work together on getting over 20,000 people to the polls along with many other partners. Then I wanna take a moment and acknowledge all of the wonderful hosts that made this event possible tonight. And the hosts are Marna Cornell, Jackie DuPont Walker, Elizabeth Ellis, Alicia Farmer, Jocelyn Griffin, Ann Hamilton, Sandy Hamilton, Tina Hostovich, Eleanor Lee, Judy Matthews, Barbara McFeeters, Susanna Porras, Volante Riddle, Shanika Robinson, Beverly Morgan Sandals, Gina Travelon, Juanita West Tillman, Connie Tyson, Deborah Ward, Carolyn Rose Williams, and Martha Zabalia. So thank you, ladies. This is only possible because of our partnership and that you were able to fill this Zoom audience with all of your contacts and friends. So thank you, all of you. Our program is going to be as follows. You've already heard from the supervisor, Alexia Few, who's the fifth district Women's Missionary Society Supervisor for the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Now you're going to hear from my fifth district president of the African Methodist Episcopal Women's Missionary Society, Deborah Rabb, who has been a friend of mine for over 40 years. So as Deborah Rabb come to the podium, you're also going to hear after her voice, the next voice that you will hear will be Jackie DuPont Walker. And after Jackie DuPont Walker, you will hear from executive team member, Janet Braun, then our keynote speaker, and then concluding with executive team member, Tina Hostovich, who will guide us in the discussion with the first partner of California. Thank you. And please, I turn it over to you, President Deborah Rapp. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we give thanks for the United States and its government. We lift in prayer before you the men and women who are in positions of authority. We pray and intercede for the president, the vice president, the representatives, the senators, the judges of our land, the police officers, as well as the governors and mayors, and for all those who have authority over us in any kind of way. We pray, Lord, that your spirit rests upon them, 
We give thanks unto you for our first partner of California, Jennifer Newsom. Wrap her in your arms and protect her from harm. We ask that the Lord prevails and grows mightily in the hearts and lives of the people. We give thanks for this land and the leaders you have given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, and thank you, President Rapp. Uh, I'm under orders from Lena Kennedy. So let me share with you, voting is a right, and we are called to duty in the spirit of Harriet Tubman and her modern day personification, Lena, Lena Kennedy. You and I have what it takes to protect that right and use it every time we're given the chance. Now, I don't see no slackers in this bunch, so here are our orders. September 14th, mark that day, is the next opportunity. Today, today, activate the 1010 plan. We're asking each person on this call to adopt and coach at least 10 voters, making sure that they vote. Recruit your 10 to coach another 10 voters. That is the spirit of Harriet Tubman, nudging our people, awakening our villages as we gallop to victory. So start today to return the ballots via the drop boxes and the mail and go to the voting centers from September 4th through the 14th. History must record our faithfulness, our courage, and our spirit of getting the job done. It's our watch, it's our time. That's our rallying call. Let's go do it. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Janet Braun, and it's my pleasure to introduce our, our honored and our special guest. We are so excited to welcome Jennifer Siebel Newsom to speak to us today. Jennifer is the first partner of California, award-winning filmmaker, advocate, and mother of four. She has written, directed, and produced the award-winning evergreen documentaries, Miss Representation, The Mask You Live In, and The Great American Lie. In 2020, she founded the California Partners Project, which champions gender equity across the state and ensures the state's media and technology industries are a force for good in the lives of all children. She also founded the Representation Project, a nonprofit that uses film and media to catalyze cultural transformation. Jennifer's films have been seen by over 28 million people worldwide and the Representation Project's social action hashtag campaigns have reached more than 830 million people. Please join me in welcoming the very impressive and accomplished Jennifer Siebel Newsom, first partner of California. Thank you. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be joining you all today and thank you my dear friend Lena for bringing us all together. This is such a treat and I've missed you and this means the world to me. Um, first, I, I do want to take a minute to extend Gavin's and my appreciation for your support. It means the world to know that Gavin has such incredible women leaders like yourselves in his corner. When Gavin was elected governor almost three years ago, he made a commitment to the people of California. He promised to fight for equality, justice, and opportunity for all. And <laughs> the minute he took office, he worked hard to deliver on that promise. As governor, he has propelled our state forward and advanced California's reputation as a global leader on climate justice, economic justice, and criminal justice reform. And as we well know, he is a true advocate and ally for California's women and families. I especially couldn't be prouder of the work that he has done to advance gender equity and a working families agenda. Gavin has committed to build a California for all, and he knows that we can't do that without creating a California for all women and a California for all children. That's why Gavin has made gender equity a top priority of this administration. Together, 
we've expanded paid family leave. We're working very hard to close the pay gap and have more women on corporate boards. We've doubled the state's investment in tax credits to put money back into the pockets of working families, a crucial benefit for low-income working mothers. And we provided grants to small businesses, essential for female entrepreneurs who face disparate barriers to capital. And as parents to four young children, Gavin and I know that bold investments in children from the earliest of ages have a tremendous impact on the trajectory of their lives. This year alone, the governor took extraordinary steps forward to make universal pre-K and universal free meals a reality for all California children. He also added 200,000 child care slots and invested 250 million to retrofit child care centers. Now we know that the pandemic has had severe impacts on children's social, emotional, and mental well-being. Fortunately, we had already spearheaded a report in partnership with the CDE that made recommendations for social and emotional learning programming at the state level. We also put out toolkits for parents and caregivers to equip themselves and their teens and preteens with tools to address the downsides of too much time online as a result of the pandemic. We launched the Governor's Advisory Council on Physical Fitness and Mental Well-Being. The Governor worked to transform public schools, something he's been working on forever, into the kind of complete campus that every parent would want for their child by investing in wraparound services from mental health support to social and family services to after school programs like tutoring. We also funded summer school. And we know that these are the building blocks our children need to thrive inside and outside of the classroom. And these initiatives will create pathways for success for California children and their families, uplifting entire communities, especially low income communities and communities of color who have been hardest hit as we all know by the pandemic. And let's talk about the pandemic. When it comes to COVID-19, Gavin followed the science from the beginning and made the tough calls that were necessary to keep California's families safe. And that's a world of a difference from what we've seen in states like Florida and Texas. Now he's continuing to lead the nation every step of the way because leading is the California way and no one knows that better than Gavin. Under his leadership, California became the first state to require vaccinations for health workers and the first state to ensure that school staff are vaccinated or get regularly tested. Because Gavin knows that protecting children and their families and vulnerable Californians is our first priority. Now, unfortunately, as we know, there's been a very, very, very vocal crew of extreme right-wing forces from Trump supporters to QAnon conspiracy theorists to anti-immigrant activists to anti-vaxxers who have had their eyes set on recalling Gavin Newsom from the start. This Republican recall and outright attack on California's values is a ploy to roll back decades of progressive policies. So everything is on the line here. Our climate policies are on the line. Criminal justice reforms are on the line. Worker protections are on the line. Gun control, early childhood education, reproductive rights, economic support for working families, especially working moms. And the very premise that women and communities of color should be treated equally. That is what's on the line September 14th. So it's up to all of us to stand up for California, a state that believes in science, a state that believes in facts, a state that believes in helping one another, that we're all equal, not in fanning the flames of hatred and bigotry. So I know we can do this, California. I have faith in us that together we can and we will defeat this recall, that together we can and we will fight for the California dream, and that together California will roar back stronger than ever. 
So I thank you again from the bottom of my heart for your continued friendship and support. And I look forward to having a conversation with you. Thank you. Tina, you have to unmute yourself. Thanks. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you very much. It's such an honor to have you here today and we so appreciate your time and look forward to celebrating uh, the end of this recall successfully with you. Um, may I address you as Jen? That's fine, thanks. Okay. Thank you, I feel like we're friends through Gavin. So. <laughs> um, we've gotten some wonderful questions today. We're gonna to be very respectful of your schedule. So I will ask as many as we can, and then we'll make sure that we get the rest of the questions to you so that they can everyone can be heard. So thank you again. I'm gonna start with the first question from Jackie DuPont Walker. And it's a question. The first part is a, and a question asked of me by many, many people. And I think it goes to the practicality and the logistics of this election. I know we've been instructed to vote no and to leave the second sheet alone, but people are asking, what would you say about writing in Gavin's name on the second sheet? Any comments or advice on that? I appreciate that. You know what? I know some people are doing that and I think that's fine. It won't count. Uh, and so that's just important to know, but it's a statement and I tend to be someone who leads with my heart and my values. And so I, I can't tell you not to do that. Thank you. <laughs> Tina, I think you're frozen, Tina. So um, I'm gonna ask the next question. I think Tina is frozen. Okay. Um, so let me bring up the questions that this technology stuff, things like this happen. I know. So just I really know. You're doing I, a great job. You guys are doing a great job. This is so impressive. <laughs> I have the question here. Um, just one more. Uh, okay, the next question would be, the next question, uh, is on, I'm going to ask a question from Lynette McCloy, Moroy. It says, what does Governor Newsom, just one moment, just one, bear with me, please. I just mm -hmm. hold on. The next question is on housing. And I wanted to know what can be done to hear the voice of mom and pop landlords who respect the majority of landlords in the state the current emphasis on help primarily to renters without assistance to landlords. For example, utility companies, forgiveness or, re or reduced rates, delayed property tax payments, bank forgiveness or other remedies. And that's from Jackie DuPont Walker who manages um, a housing unit for seniors, I believe. And I apologize, all of a sudden the internet went crazy. So okay. I'm back. Uh, no worries. I'll just um, answer this, the housing question, which is just that uh, the governor launched a 5.2 billion program to pay back 100% of rent for low income renters, regardless of immigration status who are affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So applicants can receive 100% of rent owed from April 2020 through September 2021, and 100% of those funds will go directly to the landlord so they can pay their mortgage and taxes. And then I could also just add if you want me to talk about homelessness or should we leave that for another question? There is a question dealing with that. Okay. Thank you. And I apologize on my end. So the second question is, uh, given the recent past of the severe restrictions on abortion in Texas and in other states, what do you believe the risks are to women and reproductive rights in California and what can we the citizens do to assist you and the governor with this issue? Thank you. Um, I think most important thing is to vote no on the recall. So that's number one, California has to lead the nation here. We have to stand strong and wear and share our values loudly and proudly. Um, obviously the governor and I are 
100% on the same page uh, based on this cruel, dangerous Texas law, which not only threatens women's health, but literally puts a $10,000 bounty on women's freedom and privacy. It's, it's insane. And overnight, right, in the dead of the night, the Supreme Court eviscerated the fundamental protection of a woman's right to choose that Roe v. Wade had protected for the last 50 years. So California has to lead as the fifth largest economy in the world with the largest population in terms of states. We have to ensure that women continue to have access to critical health care services, including abortion, and we will continue to lead the nation in expanding access to reproductive and sexual health care. We will also continue to appoint judges and justices who will faithfully follow the Constitution um, and the precedent um, to uphold people's rights, unlike this very disappointing inaction uh, from the high court. Uh, I, I just want to remind you that in 2019, the governor signed a proclamation on reproductive freedom, reaffirming California's commitment to protecting women's reproductive choices. So he has advanced investments to expand access to reproductive and sexual health care and sign multiple bills protecting, protecting reproductive freedom. But again, we have to wear our values loudly and proudly, and that starts with voting no uh, before September 14th. Absolutely. Thank you so much. The, the next question is from Marna Cornell, and you mentioned homelessness, and it does deal with what's on the super California, which is homelessness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the governor's really <laughs> uh, been committed to this issue from the start, from his days as mayor. And the little secret that people don't know is that um, the wonderful mayor who came after him actually did not continue his practices and policies with regards uh, to the homeless. And so San Francisco is not the San Francisco he left it in. That being said, California's comeback plan that Governor Newsom created includes almost 6 billion to add 42,000 new housing units through HomeKey, California's groundbreaking national model for homeless housing. So remember other states are now following suit. So 3 billion of this investment is dedicated to housing for people with the most acute mental health needs and those needing conservatorships. And then the plan roughly invests 12 billion over two years to tackle the homelessness crisis. Um, so you're gonna continue to see a lot of work. He's, you know, having been a mayor who managed a city and a county, he was invested in this issue 100%. And he's definitely been disappointed by the lack of commitment to addressing this at the local level. But I think there's a really, um, he has some wonderful relationships with mayors and a real commitment and he's taking responsibility even if he believes it should be local responsibility because there's so many funds that are being sent their way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I mean, it's just wanna, you know, let's get through September 14th. And then I think we all have to hold our local electeds accountable just as he's holding them accountable by giving them the resources and the model for how to get ourselves out of this mess. Absolutely. Thank you. And it, you're absolutely right. It's so important to also address that at the local community level. And I know that we have the governor's support on the issue as a state. So thank you. The next question is from Susan Turner. And the question is, what are your main priorities for, for California citizens, including any special projects that you're working on? And do you support girls having STEM, S-T-E-M, education? Yes, yes, great question. So I think you know, but I think a lot of people don't actually know. I mean, prior to um, this position, I, I launched the representation project really focused on empowering and uplifting women and girls. And my first documentary, Misrepresentation, had this sort of cultural- oh, <laughs> Big fan of that. Oh, oh, okay, thank you. Had sort of this cultural reverberation that, um, is still to this day, I have young women stopping me daily who say that the film transformed the trajectory of their life and their path or gave them a voice or, you know, made them decide they were going to run for office or be in um, the, uh, the, the news and journalistic um, uh, world uh, to sort of right the wrongs and uh, use their voice. So 
I came into this with a commitment to uplifting all women and girls. I've also done a lot of work looking at boys and how we're socializing on boys and how we've failed our boys as relates to sort of the boy crisis in America. And so really, I would say out of the first partner's office, and it's clear if you go to the governor's website, my focus is on women and children and families um, and breaking down barriers for youth and advancing gender equity in California. So I, some of what I shared with you earlier are is, issues and policies that I've championed at, out of the first partner's office. Um, so I don't, I won't go back through all of those again, but that's the, the 21st century feminist agenda uh, partnership that, you know, the, the governor and I are committed to. Um, but I also will just share a few things with you that I'm, I'm really proud of um, because I think equity is, uh, equity can, can uh, or elements of equity can be achieved um, through different means and, and uh, paths. So one thing that we just um, created this year were two special pilot programs to expand park access for California children by providing a free year of park access to 19 California state parks for every fourth grader and their family in the state, as well as free day passes to state parks for library patrons. Um, we all know the social, emotional, physical, and mental health benefits of time in nature, time outdoors. Well, I would actually argue not all of us do know that. And so that's what I'm trying to do is really um, educate and inspire a, a recognition of the, the, the bounty, the beauty that we have here in California and the opportunity to take advantage of it and really make these parks accessible for all California children. So those are just two, you know, budget plays that I'm super proud of this year that I'm excited um, that are coming into fruition. Another one is the work I've led with this expanding our farm to school program, farm to school programming across the state of California. In 2019, the governor's budget established a California farm to school grant program that supports local procurement of fresh on the scale of organic or towards regenerative food in California schools. And so this, this was a really big and important play for me, uh, given that we partnered with the different agencies of not just education, but health and human services and um, EPA and state parks to kind of come together to try and uh, uh, create a, a local procurement system that benefits the local economy, that benefits local workers, and that benefits local ch you know, children in their schools by ensuring that these two free meals that they're gonna be getting uh, based on the most recent um, governor's commitments, govern the most recent commitments from the governor, that these are fresh, they're local, they're on the scale towards organic or regenerative, and that we're moving kids in a direction where health their health and well-being is of central importance. So I'm really excited about this, given that California was the first state in the nation to make free meals permanent for all public school students, regardless of family's income. Thank you. And those are amazing projects. Thank you so much. One question a lot of people asked in terms of the topic, which you um, you mentioned how beautiful California is, and I couldn't agree with you more. A lot of people have talked about the climate or have asked about climate crisis. Um, we all know the United Nations said this is a red alert for humanity. And so how can we, I mean, what I know the governor's worked a lot towards that issue, if perhaps you could share some of that, but also what can we do to it in that as Californians? Thank you. Again, vote no, because- Yeah, the but, but vote no first. It's exactly, it is so, so scary. So that's number one. So this is an issue that's really important to me. If I can share with you, I um, lived and worked in Africa and Latin America with Conservation International prior to going to Stanford Business School and then getting into the entertainment industry and making documentary films. So my background is in conservation and environmental work and, and, and ironically in working with women entrepreneurs in developing countries, helping them to create 
environmentally, we use the word sustainable then, yeah. uh, businesses that could thrive that wouldn't impact biodiversity and conservation. So this is something that's really, really important to me. And especially the linkage between um, climate change and equity and gender and racial justice. So that's where, that's what the governor has been committed to and that's where what we're focused on and that's the work that we wanna do ideally over the next five years. So, so far though, so you all know, because I think he's done so much that it gets lost in the news cycle. Um, sometimes I think that the media isn't really interested in facts and they really just want like fallacious stories. So here's the reality that Governor Newsom has advanced strategic investments to protect people and the environment from catastrophic climate impacts in that we've in working with the legislature we've allocated approximately nine billion dollars over three years that will assist communities in preparing for climate impacts including wildfires extreme heat and drought with additional funding to address environmental justice priorities um there's there's so much packed in there uh that it's just like we're just we've been doing a lot of this land management and what have you unlike what was trump calling it <laughs> but um, but there's so much in there, so I'm gonna. But I'm just gonna kind of go through the list of things. Um, in this recent California comeback plan, it includes a 3.9 billion package to hit fast forward on our zero emission vehicle strategy. The goal of being to that you know this is the biggest contributor of emissions driving climate change. So the the um, zero emission vehicle goal of uh, 20. 40, is it 35 or 45? Um, I'm, I'm getting confused right now by the dates, but 45, is that right? Okay. Um, that is, th this is this is a big play, right? This is gonna have a huge impact. But immediately, just a few things. The governor's move to halt the issuance of new fracking permits by 2024. And there's more on that to come in late, uh, I think early October, so stay tuned on that. And he's also, he's also banned the, pesti the pesticide chlorpyrifos. Chlorpyrifos. I can never that say chlorpyrifos. That <laughs> um, so that's a big one. Um, and there's more there. I'm uh, really, as a, obviously, as a mother of young children and seeing what uh, pesticides, the impact of pesticides on our health and well being, there's going to be a lot more at play there. Um, so we're upping a lot of regulation to in that realm. And then the Newsom climate agenda also includes a pledge to conserve 30% of the state's land and waters by 2030 and directives to the California Air Resources Board to map out a pathway to carbon neutrality by 2035 and an end to oil extraction by 2045. So all of these things are in process and at stake in this election. Thank you. Uh, that was initially the question was from Marna Cornell, but I got 35 texts today with the same question on, on climate. I think we're all very, very interested. And for me, I, I live in a fire area, so particularly interested <laughs> in that. So, and again, everyone vote no. We have time for one last question and then if I would welcome any additional comments that you would like to share with us. The last question is a little bit specific, but I think it's important and we can certainly have you bring this to the governor. But the question is from Dr. Edna Miller and Stacy Calhoun. It's prior to the pandemic, and I think it's good for a model for California in general, this question. Prior to the pandemic, our school clinic turned in a unique proposal to the governor, which is under review. Are there any plans by the governor, again, we have to vote now first, to set up a mechanism to provide long-term funding to school-based clinics that focus on exposure to adverse childhood experiences, which as you know, have yeah. been linked to subsequent adult depression, mental illness, substance abuse, yeah. and so on. So that, that was a question, again, sort of directed to the governor, but would welcome very much your thoughts on that. Well, so 100%. So the governor appointed our friend, my friend, Nadine Burke, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, as the first Surgeon General of California. And this mm -hmm. is her issue. It's also my issue because I think you get to a certain age in life and you realize that 
if you haven't experienced it yourself, everyone, most people around you, you know, someone who's experienced mm -hmm. trauma, right? You know, someone, right. you know, someone that's still living in their trauma because they haven't had proper support and treatment and therapy of, you know, and there's a, there are ways of, of treatments, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, this issue is everything. It's one of the reasons I'm so focused on children and women because women are the backbones of their families and their communities and society. And if we women can be supported and enveloped with love and support, then we can hold, you know, our, our, our children in a way, um, uh, whether we have a, a partner in our life or not that, you know, enables us to kind of break the cycle a bit um, because we, right? Because kids, as I mean, I don't know if many, maybe you all experienced this yourselves, but I experienced during the pandemic, one of my children who, two of my children have learning differences and one of them, his anxiety skyrocketed and he was just sort of absorbing the governors in my anxiety, mm -hmm. right? And kids really parrot or mimic what they're interacting with every day. Mm -hmm. So a hundred percent, that's a long-winded way of answering your question, which is, I believe his community school model is his attempt to do just that. Mm -hmm. And so just a reminder, because I, I shared this earlier, that he's investing a lot of money in this sort of wraparound campus that we would all want for our kids with you know, mental health support, proper mental health support and proper social services and proper family services and food banks and tutoring and really enriching after school programs um, so that our children in California can get the best start in life. Part of this is as is in Dr. Nadine Burke's budget to test kids at the earliest of ages. And just like I actually, he's been pushing for this and I feel like we're doing a pilot, forgive me, I haven't been updated on this, on even testing for dyslexia at the earliest of ages. Cause I've been, I've been, you know, I finally got smart. I didn't realize my first daughter didn't know how to read and was just a really good, like my husband like, had this incredible memory yeah. and just sort of was so social and, and articulate right. that she hid the fact that she couldn't wow. read. Yeah. And so I tested my kids a little later and I tested my son earlier than her. And what a, what a difference. That kid's mm -hmm. son is so much wow. more confident than she is because I caught it earlier because he's younger. So my whole point in being, to your point in this beautiful question, we mm -hmm. have to, and this is why I love Linda Darling Hammond, the head of the school board, who is mm -hmm. so invested in not just testing kids earlier, just as Nadine Burke is in the other realm of trauma, but also in empowering our educators with the tools to diagnose earlier, just as we want to empower our doctors with the tools to diagnose earlier. Um, and I will just add, sorry, because it's not, it was supposed to be, it, it was, um, I, I really thought because of the mental health, like forget the pandemic. If you mm -hmm. just spend time online, you mm -hmm. see that we are a broken society right now. At least that's what to me is not to be Debbie Downer, but online, it maybe we're not, let's just say, but if you spend too much time online. <laughs> dysfunctional at best. <laughs> there's a lot of dysfunction, a lot of anger, a lot of pain, a lot of sadness. It's not healthy. I can't believe this is the culture we're creating for future generations. I don't want my kids to have to be, go through it. I, I am very sensitive to it and don't, and think it's toxic and not good for anyone. That being said, mental health is like the issue, I think, of the day. And the pandemic made it worse. And so I think you're going to see a lot more from me and him and HHS and hopefully in partnership with the Surgeon General and the schools. And one of the things that I fought for was for um, services to our teachers and parent bodies so that they could support their kids in this transition back to school. Unfortunately, I think those services are coming a little later than I would like them to come because that tends to be what happens, unfortunately, sometimes in government, but they're coming. And the Child Mind Institute is an organization that's going to be, um, uh, um, what is the word? Um, like providing tools and resources mm -hmm. to teachers and administrators and parents so that we can hold our children, our families and our communities together. And we need that support now more than ever. So. I'm really excited about that and just know this is so important and I'm, I'm grateful that this question was asked. 
Well, we're at the end of our time for questions. I can't thank you enough. I do want to tell everyone whose question we didn't get to today, we will get those to you because we want you to hear everyone on behalf of everyone on the call, on behalf of Lena and from the bottom of my grateful little heart. I am so appreciative and we are so honored to have you here today. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else that you would like to add that we haven't talked about? And Lena, please, uh, please guide me. I'll just, before you close, Lena, if I can just say thank you, God bless you, all of you. This is beautiful. You rallied so quickly overnight. I am so grateful. Um, I, I really believe that there is just strength in, and power in this community. And I am so grateful to be welcomed into it today. And know I want you to know that I'm your partner. And I hope that we can just get through this ickiness and out to the other <laughs> side. We can do some really, really, really important work together. Um, I'm really proud of the governor. This has not been an easy three years. We've had not just a pandemic and wildfires as you all have experienced personally, but you know, crisis after crisis and yeah. no time to rest. And so I just want you to know his heart and soul is with you. He's committed to you. He's been fighting for you every day. My poor kids don't seem very much, but we're going to get through this and out to the other side. And um, just thank you for inviting me to be a part of your family today. I'm so grateful. Well, we're so grateful for you. And thank you, uh, Janet Braun, Jackie DuPont Walker, President Deborah Rapp, Tina Hoskovich for your leadership. These are the women that are part of Women in Leadership Vital Voices that really lead and guide us, along with the other names I mentioned. I do want to say two more things that will allow us to go into the rest of our hour. Uh, I wanted to, first of all, ask you from all of us and from our hearts, what is it, and I thank you for including me in the work that you're doing with young women. Uh, I really appreciate that. And I learned, I learned about the pronouns when I came to lunch with you three <laughs> years ago, when you were pulling all the young women together. And I said, please help me explain, help me, help me understand what these pronouns are. So now on my signature, I have my pronouns. But more importantly for us today, in addition to the recall, we want to know how we can rally behind you once we get out of this recall and partner with you and support you. And this is a group of dynamic women that are on this Zoom. And we want to be partners with you. So can you tell us? how, what your vision is for us and how we can support and support you and the governor. Oh, you're on, you're on mute. Jen, you're on mute. Hold on a second. Let's see. Here we go. I mean, I'm in. <laughs> I was locked out. I couldn't speak. Thank you. Um, just being our friend, <laughs> number one, uh, all of you, um, there's power in the sisterhood. Uh, we're allies. We're partners. Um, I think we have to uplift the feminine. We have to uplift care. We have to uplift love. We have to uplift um, continue to uplift each other and, um, but really uplift women. And I mean, I, I, if you follow me on social media or through our work in the governor's office, I'm always trying to uplift other women and give platforms and voice and opportunity, uh, to other women. Cause that's, that's what I consider partnership to be. And I feel like that's an important role. Um, you know, I think, I think one thing I'll, I'll just share one thing because so many of you have are have strong spiritual cores and connections. I would love just I <laughs> it just means so much to have your love and support because um, these are trying times in our democracy, and I think the governor's had everyone's backs and. For folks to have his back and my back and our back as a family um, and to just help buffer us and pray for us and be with us and 
fight with us because we got a lot of fighting to do. Um, you know, I think we can affect so much change in California if we work together. And so I just, I want to work with you. I want to be as strategic and committed and, um, you know, we started and then the pandemic happened and the energy crisis happened and the wildfires keep happening and they're going to be here a little bit longer. I hate to say it. It's not going to change overnight, but we have to have each other's backs. Um, and so just, I just appreciate the partnership and the sisterhood um, and, and the love. I really do. I can't tell you enough because there's way too much hate out there, too much hate online. The media, I'm like, what are they doing sometimes? <laughs> Not telling the truth, misrepresenting the truth. It's no, it's no surprise I made a documentary called Misrepresentation. But just just trusting us, knowing us, and 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 being with us and and partnering with us. I think we're gonna get through a lot. And that's really just final words. Uh the governor wants to stabilize California. California, but but part of that is getting California back on track to make sure equality, justice, and opportunity is available for everyone. So we have a lot of work to do, and we can and we will do it. And it's got to be in partnership. So partnership is really what I ask of you. And thank you for your kindness and and to be continued. And let's just get through this. And then I can't wait to see you all again. I'm I'm so grateful for your time. So grateful. Well, thank you so much. And there were a lot of questions that were asked. Lynette West Carter, if you're on the line, can you let me know? Um, there were a lot of questions asked about people that have not received their ballot in the mail as of yet. And mm -hmm. Tina McKenna put on there to go to your polling place and we will get that to you. If you reach out to our office, uh, Tina McKenna is on our leadership team. She said, go to your ballot and go to your polling place and ask for a provisional ballot. Yes. Okay. But if you contact my office, we will walk you through that process. Uh, and Tina McKenna will be available to talk to you as well. But we want to make sure that everyone, when you're calling your 10 individuals and they tell you they do not have their ballot or they have not received it, call my office. We will help you. I will um, call up Tina and we're gonna make it happen because we're all in this together. There was one other question that was asked by Lynette West Carter. If I could ask this, um, it says government sub subsidies seem to be, and this may not be a question that you can answer, but I wanna put it out there. Yeah. Government subs subsidies seem to be an idea, idea way, ideal way to assist low moderate income buyers to purchase homes in California. How much money has the state allocated for affordable housing in Los Angeles County in 2021? And how many households are expected to benefit? And how does this compare to, to 2019? That's from Lynette West Carter. Yeah, I don't have the specific facts on Los Angeles County, um, but I know that there's a, as I, I said earlier, a huge investment in housing it was a priority of the governors from the get-go and then reinforced just prior to the pandemic. So you're gonna see a lot of change there and I'm excited about that. I think you may know I made a documentary on social immobility and economic inequality. And so that is, this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. And obviously housing is what is driving the cost of, of living in California and making it so unaffordable. So just know that there's more to come. There's some legislation, I believe he's signing shortly. Um, and and I, I there's hope on the horizon. And that, that's what I can say. But I'm happy to have somebody get back to you in terms of LA County specific. Yeah. Great, and I will make sure you get Lynette's email address. I will give all of that to your team members. Uh, if there are no more questions, I just want to say thank you to every last one of you who took time from your busy Friday to be with us for this hour. And to my friend, Jen, it's so good seeing you. And I always enjoy spending time with you. And we look forward to continuously working with you and knowing that you have the African Methodist Episcopal Church, you have women in leadership, vital voices, you have uh, Jocelyn with the NAACP women with NAACP, 
we're all in this together. And AME Be Alert, we're there for you and our state, our communities, and we can't do this without you. It's, community, it's a partnership. So thank you for your time. Uh, we love you, adore you, and we have such respect for you. And give a big hug to your babies for us. Oh, thank you. Love you all. Thank you for all your time. Bye. Bye. Take care. Be safe. Thank you. Take care. Lots Bye. of love. Thank you.